Good afternoon, everyone. It's my honor to welcome you all in the second edition of Orange City Literature Fest, organized by SGR Knowledge Foundation. I, Himanshi Kandhari, will be the anchor for this session, and the topic of this session is Let's Talk Homecoming, which is of 40 minutes. Ma'am, you will get a buzzer sound when 10 minutes are left in completion of session. The guest for this session is Janvi Bhagwa Ma'am. She is an Indian writer based in Bangalore. Next door is her debut collection of short stories was long listed for the Frank O'Connor International Short Story Award. Her next, a novel called Rebirth, was shortlisted for the Man Asian Literary Prize and the Commonwealth Writers Prize. The third, Undertow, a novel was published by Penguin Random House India in February 2020 and was long listed for the JCB Prize for Literature 2020 and the BLF Ataglata Book Prize 2020. Anushri Kaushal Ma'am will be the moderator for this session. She is an editor. She previously worked at Penguin Random House India, commissioning a range of fiction and non-fiction books, specializing in politics, international relations, and literary and genre fiction. She likes murder mysteries, a well-delivered joke, and all things Russia. Handing the session to you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Manshi. Um, welcome, everyone, who has joined us today for the Orange City Literature Festival. Um, I'm really excited to be here, especially today in conversation with uh, the wonderful Janavi Barwa, who is a uh, novel uh, undertow, which looks like this, has a gorgeous cover, was published recently in February of this year. Um, the, session, the, the topic for today's session is homecoming, which of course is a predominant theme in Janavi's book. And Janavi, if I may start uh, by asking you, um, what, what is it that, that kind of, you know, compelled you to focus on homecoming as a theme in Undertow? What was your, what was your thought process when you were conceptualizing the book? And, uh, you know, what led you to kind of focus so much on homecoming? And, you know, homecoming is just one of the many themes that kind of Undertow focuses on. There is, there's loss, there is regret, there is resentment, there's guilt, but homecoming kind of remains the, the, the biggest theme um, in the novel. So if I may start the session by asking you, Janvi, to, to tell me about um, your, your, you know, your thought process behind the book, and of course, a little bit about the book itself. Thank you, Anushri. Um, thank you so much, uh, the Orange City Literature Festival, for this platform to speak about Undertow. I must um, say right at the beginning, it, it was Anushri who picked up the book, who spotted Undertow, as it were, and uh, Gave it a very warm home in Penguin Random House. Thank you so much for that. It wouldn't of have course. been possible without you. Uh, so when you asked me what um, inspired or what sort of um, uh, stirred me to write um, Undertow, mm -hmm. I think I have always been um, very interested in the themes of belonging, belonging and unbelonging. Uh, mm -hmm. Perhaps somewhere I've said this before, it stems from the fact that I've led a very nomadic life. My father was in the civil services. So, you know, every couple of years, sometimes even a couple of um, a few months, you sort of approach yourself and move to the next city. And usually it would be like um, a midterm. So you you enter a class in the middle of uh, half the year is gone and you sit in the back bench and you, know, you don't know anybody and nobody knows you. You start making friends, you catch up on missed work. Mm -hmm. And um, in a way, it allows you to see uh, life from the outside. It's kind of from the outside looking in. And um, you get used to it, but somewhere I think it gives you a different perspective from someone else who's always lived in one place, who's always belonged. And as I grew up, it was not just place, it was very many things, communities, a country so vast. I mean, you're from the northeast of India, when you move around so much, you're always questioned. Uh, from the northeast, oh, um, do you speak Hindi there? No. Uh, what do you eat there? Do you eat snakes? You know, it's like so many things come up, right, in, in, in my time, in the 70s and 80s when I was young. And um, so you were, you had a very distinct feeling of belonging and unbelonging. That was definitely a very concrete thing in front of you. Mm -hmm. And um, that has always made me um, sort of empathetic to the outsider, to someone on the margins, you know, to someone who's really not part of the, 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 the mass. And um, there's always been a deep sympathy for the other. 
in many ways. And today, the others translated into many things, into people from different geographies, into people of different sexualities, into people from different um, economic strata. So I somehow had this um, sort of um, resonance with the other. And what better way to explore belonging than to ex explore home? To explore mm -hmm. the place. Yes, so yes. In this in this story is a lawyer who is uh, whose mother's from the northeast of India, from Assam, whose father's from Bangalore. Uh, besides, um, uh, late in her young life, she's 25. She she's no longer a child, but she's no longer really really a fully grown woman in that sense. She's a young woman, and she, um, as a result of her family situation, decides to go back to Assam to see if there was a home there. I mean, and she didn't even know it when she was doing it. She went. Um, she was telling herself she was going there to research to work on her uh, PhD. But really, as it goes along, I think she and the reader realize that um, she is actually looking for home. So, um, and in that journey, along the journey, so many things come about: right place, home. So I've explored home at many levels, as you've seen, uh, yeah. as in place, as in place, which is the most important thing. And um, many questions come up here as to. Uh, which place is home? The place you're born in, the place your mother's from, the place you have been raised in, the place you study in, or the place you work in. Can many places yeah. be home? Yes, many places can be home. I, I, I felt that in my own life. These questions I explored again and again. The physical house is explored. I think to any human being, you know, be it from wherever in the world, be it a small hut or a huge mansion, that home, you know, that front door, you know, your your space is so important. So the physical house, I think the yellow house is explored, uh, the yeah. Glenburn yeah. is explored. And then, of course, that final virtual place is, of course, what is what is really, really the home for us, wherein you feel welcome and loved. So home is explored at all these levels and many other things that you said, family, relationships, man and woman, marriage, friendships, you know, almost all these facets of the human condition, as it were, are explored here. Yeah, and, and like you mentioned, Noya is kind of struggling with almost each of these elements. She is 25 years old. She's, she's grown up in Bangalore. But she's always been cognizant of the fact that there has been another family which she's never met, she's never really spoken to. They have essentially been estranged from them all her life. But she still decides to take this really bold step and kind of goes and sees her grandfather. Her grandmother, who um, was basically the reason why her own mother, Loya's own mother, Rukmini, was shunned from the family, um, is now dead. And uh, her grandfather, Torun Goswami, who is the patriarch and who is living in the Yellow House, which I personally think is a beautiful symbolism of something that kind of roots you into a place and kind of essentially gives you an identity uh, based in multiple things, your ethnicity, the place you come from, etc. as well. So Loya is the one who kind of goes back and decides to, um, you know, under the guise of also, in a way, figuring out her PhD thesis, decides to figure these things out for herself and kind of um, make herself known to this part of the family. And Jandi, you and I have discussed in the past as well how the relationships that you, you talk about relationships really beautifully. And the relationship that she manages to build with her grandfather, Torun, is really, really special. And I really want to understand from you how, how you, how, you know, your, your kind of your inspirations and your thought processes behind how you deal with relationships and how you write about them. Anushree, I think I've been fortunate in that, um, despite this very nomadic lifestyle, um, yeah. loosely our structure was a joint family structure. In the sense, uh, in my very early years uh, in our family home in Shillong, uh, there were four generations. There was my great grandmother, there were my grandparents, there were my parents, and I, and my goodness, assorted cousins and uncles and aunts and nephews and people being, you know, some um, aunt would come and have deliver a baby in our family home, you know, so there was always something <laughs> happening. And I yeah. loved it. Yeah. I loved that um, structure. For me, that was. Um, that was the world. I mean, this, mm -hmm. this huge uh, family was the world. And even as we moved along for long stretches, my grandparents would come and live with us, let's say for a year. Uh, they would just come and live a year with us in Delhi, you know? So um, nice. essentially for us, family really meant, uh, and you know, my, my, my dad, was, when I, whenever I asked him, I said, oh, so so-and-so is coming from this issue long. Is your second or third cousin? So he'd look at me and say, second, third? Is my cousin, you know? So we didn't want to pass on second cousin, third cousin, you know. So um, until today, we maintain the relationships. I'm in touch with um, cousins who are not my first cousin, but second, third cousins. My son knows his fourth cousins, you know. Right. So um, but we call them all family. Within the family, I realized as you grow up is that you practically see every relationship you'll see in the outside world. You know, you see authority, you see defiance, uh, you see love, you see uh, unlove, you see betrayals. Mm -hmm. Uh, you're taught honesty, but you also see dishonesty sometimes, you know. So I think the family is such a um, 
an important training ground. You know, it, it's really where you learn to be. You 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 become what you are to a large extent. Mm -hmm. And um, this particular book, I think, my relationship with my grandfather, who the book is dedicated to, informed it. In that, um, okay. I was really very close to him. And I think that's a very special relationship between grandparents and grandchildren. You skip that generation of authority. You don't have to deal with your parents. You know, it's out of the mm -hmm. way. And this is a, this is a relationship of pure love and indulgence you know uh, yes, they, have, yes. they have discipline and brought up their children now they can afford to be indulgent with you and similarly with you it's a journey of learning of love and um, without too much else getting in the way so i think that is and i think that's a, such an important relationship for a child you know and right, um, right. it strengthens you in a way that you know even today i still remember something my grandfather said you know you should do this this way and i and i blindly follow it because you know he had said that while he was still here with me, you know, so um, I think I think this um, and between this granddaughter and grandfather, I thought would be a very strong connection to uh, display or to illustrate the, the family bonds that can spring up in a family. So that's why Laura and grandfather went through, you know. On, yeah, on yeah, yeah, and that's, I can, that's such a beautiful experience to live yourself, but also that that comes out really strongly in the book as well, because the way Tarun and Loya are kind of growing with each other as well. And, you know, you would imagine in a very, on a very uh, superficial level, you would imagine that, oh, Tarun is the older person, so he obviously knows the ways of the world a lot better than Loya does. But of course, he's learning from Loya as much as she is learning from him. And she is learning more, more concrete things from him, you know, her culture, the political background of Assam. But Tarun is also learning very emotional things from Loya. And, and not to spoil it for the reader, but, you know, he kind of comes to elevate himself from how he had seen his own life and his wife and Rukmini in the past and comes to, in a weird way, in its own way, kind of accept Rukmini for how she is and accept Loya in a, in a new way altogether. Um, but, and you know, um, the readers who have read it and the, the very many reader reviews that we have read on Goodreads and otherwise on social media so far kind of really love that aspect of it. But one of the most um, the, one of the one of the aspects from the book that they really particularly get really hit hard by is are the final moments of the book, which you know you know what I'm talking about. It's it's not an easy ending, and I'm not going to spoil it for whoever is watching who has not read the book yet. But it is it is a difficult kind of an ending to a book which is consistently getting more and more hopeful with each page. But it sort of ends on a note where you're just like you're hopeful, but you're also kind of scared. And and Janvi, I want to know from you when you were writing this, how hard was it for you to kind of write, you know, that particular scene? And of course, I would I would leave it up to you to kind of give it away if you want to give that scene away in its entirety. But I want to understand from you, you know, what were some of the hardest things uh, for you to write in this book, and especially that last part, that that final kind of the denouement of the book. Um, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy <laughs> because um, I think. Uh, um, in the past, I've always veered towards, you know, let's make it happy. You know, um, if yeah. you've read my previous novel, Rebirth, it's like it, it really ends. Um, some ties are broken, but very strongly, hopefully, other ties are already slipping into place, right? So it ends on a very upbeat note. Uh, here, um, I think my whole vision for the book was that this was going to be a very cautionary tale. You know, this was, um, this, uh, was going to illustrate... Uh, how you have to mend certain things in time. You know, there is, I, I, I don't believe, I'm one of those people who, uh, I, I don't like to sleep on a quarrel. I don't like to, uh, if it's important to me, not try and mend a relationship or do something or fix something uh, which has uh, gone wrong. And uh, I realized that, you know, if you leave things too late, uh, it's human nature. Sometimes um, your intensity of feeling for the other party goes down and it's like, okay, fine. I mean, uh, I haven't spoken to her for 20 years and, you know, let's, why should I now try and make amends, you know? So I do feel when feelings are raw, it could swing the other way feelings are intense you know but um, that is actually the right moment you know maybe give it a couple of nights sleep on it and then reach out and see what you can fix if you don't and if you uh, let other things get in the way you know um, there is a good chance um, that it will not end well like it hasn't ended well here you know mm -hmm. what you say about the scene and uh, how hard was it to write this scene very hard and i didn't want to um, i think in any case when i'm writing i'm very conscious of things being um, less than more you know and i've always had this huge i have this uh, thing in in real life and otherwise that less is always more you can say everything fewer words with the fewer flourishes but as effectively so my um crafting concern in the scene was that uh, it has to be really um it 
it has to of course have impact but it has to um, not really get too over the top and um, that that is what i was concerned about and i think sometimes i feel like it is so well some readers said what if turned the patient gone back did this happen or not oh yes this yeah. happened. Yeah. so it's, it's kind of it's slipped into your story you know so yes, yeah, yeah. Really but, but you know for this whole journey i keep telling people for lawyer's journey to have any meaning um, uh -huh. there, wouldn't any weight. there wouldn't be any weight to her journey if it's happened. yeah yeah no and that totally yeah. comes through in the book as well and you know you mentioned you mentioned the craft and you mentioned you know when you were crafting that final scenes and i've i've always i'm always intrigued in general uh, about the crafts that each the craft that each author kind of adopts for themselves and you know your writing is almost universally beloved like everyone who has read the book if there's one line that they are able to say about the book it is that it's so evocative and beautifully written and and you know you and i were also talking about this uh, sometime in the past but the language remains you know your sentence structure is almost perfect on a sentence level it's perfect on a sentence level but you know you don't add those flourishes which might be which are somewhat unnecessary on a on a sentence level as well your writing is super simple but super evocative it's gorgeous and you're transported into the story but you still manage to keep it simple you still manage to kind of reach the lay reader um and you know it always reminds me of you know almost like ian mcewen or jhumpa lahiri the way the, when i read rebirth when i read rebirth and when i read uh, undertow as well and i really want to understand from you you know your inspirations behind the way you write and and your craft your crafting process as well you know i've i've thought about this over the years and i've um, realized that um, for any author i think eventually <laughs> he or she um, whatever he or she is actually translates onto the page and um, if, you, if you're a um, you know um, a super frilly person, you like everything lush, and you know you you know uh, want everything. Um, you want a busy room. You know your style of dressing is very busy. You know, and your your prose, I think more likely than not, will be uh, lush. You know, <laughs> I think I think I, I am a simple person. I have this sort of philosophy in life. Where in in the house, I don't mind one less pen or pencil. I don't want an extra pencil in the house. You know, when you want that extra pencil, go get it. You know, so um, I'm 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 in a sense very minimal. You know, with with everything in life and um, by nature. And I think my medical training somewhere has also helped that. That get rid of the clutter. Get to the point. You know, and I enjoy this kind of. Um, writing i enjoy reading it you know so mm -hmm. my favorite mm -hmm. would be an even McQueen. it would be um, uh, alice munro it would be somebody very spare it would be a salinger you know who would um, you know at, at the sentence level really sort of impact you you know yes. so when yeah. when i enjoy that kind of reading um, that sort of uh, writing from other authors i think very naturally it's the kind of writing i want to write you know so it's not really been mm -hmm. conscious conscious i don't think i could write lush and over the top if i wanted to so in a way it's a blessing so, in fact, uh, I, I would have to struggle to do that. This comes naturally. So I don't really, <laughs> don't really have to work too much at it. Um, I think it's just a, sort of a presentation on paper of who I am. You know, so it's, right. it's, it's, that makes it easy. And in the end, um, even a literary book, even literary fiction, I think you don't have to dazzle the reader. I feel that you, um, it can be simple. It can be simple. The danger there being that uh, people think, oh, it was so, it's, it's too simple. I mean, it's um, you didn't really work hard at it. It's much harder to write a simple, um, to write simple prose, that is to really put all the adjectives and adverbs and everything out there, right? I mean, when you're Absolutely. writing it, it's so um, yeah, it's, it's it's just I think um, a presentation of who I am really on the page. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. Like uh, Ian McEwen is also one of my favorite authors, and I always find it kind of a lot more enticing when the writing is just you know just simpler to kind of grasp. And I mean, even yes. can use kind of it. I mean, obviously, it, it it I don't want to make it sound like I'm paring it down to its most basic forms but you know it's almost as if you know if you're able to do it without using a fancier sounding synonym yes. and still affect the reader it's almost yes. magical it's almost that much more magical in its own way um yeah and and you've done that so successfully with, with undertow too but i um and i know this but like it took you a while to kind of get undertow in shape and you know it took you so what was your uh, what was your kind of process of writing undertow specifically well, what's I the story? Think, yeah, what was your, you know, like your, as a writer, I many revisions you had to do, etc. Sorry, yeah. I think with Andato, I surprised myself too because with Rebirth and Next Door, Rebirth, I practically, honestly, didn't even redraft. 
it was that one draft you know it uh, with a few changes here and there so also my short stories because the way i work is um i take a lot of time thinking about it and practically scene by scene by line by line in my head when i put it down it's almost like just transcribing it's already there and then the short story is finished you know uh, so also paper, i kind of had everything uh, in my head and i don't write down i don't have post-its i don't have um, you know a file where i make notes it's in my head and i finish it with undertow i think the challenge was that um unlike rebirth or my short fiction uh, i chose two protagonists i mean you you know it right it, there's no one protagonist and uh, it's so easy in rebirth i could just um, sort of tie myself to kaberi and just you know mm. let it run. here um, i really wanted to be fair to both loya and doron and um, in various drafts so, so so when i redrafted i redraft the whole thing so i would go from chapter 1 to chapter 10 and uh, i wrote it eight or nine times through and um, just wanting that that balance of the of weight of presence and voice for both the characters to be equal. I didn't want to uh, be partial to Loya or I didn't want to indulge um, Torun. And only when that got sorted, you know, initially, of course, the structure of the book, since you're asking, was actually in the very first half was different chapters, one chapter for Loya, one chapter for Torun. And then mm -hmm. I it's like you know um no it's not really working so now we have sections as you saw there's a section yeah, yeah. and right from the first line you know whose section it is whose point of view it is right and that that seemed to me more fluid more more seamlessly working and that's how i did it but this balance between the two that the story or the characters or the plot or the mood um, was not an issue it was how to put it down so both of them are balanced it took a long time it as you know it took almost eight years so although it seems simple and it's up there and it's a very slim small book but um there's a lot of work behind it no, no, of course, and, and I mean, I'm so glad when I that I when I got to read it. The final product was in in as perfect a shape as as I could have potentially hoped it to be. And you know, when you and I were editing the book, I think my the feedback from my side was as minimal as it needed to be. I think so. Yeah, I mean, I was glad to have read it in a in a form that you know, like you guys are and whoever has read the book is probably reading it in its in its most kind of you know final shape. And um, I was really glad to have read it in you know in that same form as well um but you know one of the other things that you kind of mentioned um what is you said that the you know the mood and the atmosphere were relatively easier for you to kind of reach but when you're writing in general and i'm sure you're working on something else as well right now um but when you're working on short stories and when you're working on rebirth what is the most difficult part for you and outside of undertow as well is it is it the characterization is it the plot as a whole? Is it the underlying themes that the reader is supposed to pick up on? What is the most kind of difficult thing for you and, and the most important thing for you? Two different questions, I would imagine, for you to kind of, when you're writing, what, what are those two things that you feel are? You know, if I were to think of it, um, I don't think any one thing stands out. Right. I think, I think the whole process of uh, getting a story into your head, getting the characters um, into your head, uh, knowing the arc of the story, knowing where it's going to, you know, climax and come down and resolve and, you know, all that. The, the whole process takes time for me, but no one facet is more difficult than the other. Right. And, um, and like I said, I spent a, I, I may spend a year thinking about it. I'm, I, I do not go right into writing. I will not put the first chapter down. So one, once I'm even sure of the last line and the first line and, you know, uh, the mood of the story and what the character likes to wear is when I begin to write. So, so in that way, since a lot of wrestling has gone on in my mind already as I've been you know, doing housework or I'm <laughs> having a coffee or I'm taking my son somewhere. Um, yes. the, hard work is done. the writing, the writing process is literally just transcribing, just writing it down. You know? Yeah. So yeah. Um, it's, it's all of it. For me, it all, it all comes together at once. And all it doesn't, then it just sits for a couple of months. You know? Yes. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't push it. I don't, I don't have a character but not a plot and then start pushing the character. I, I don't do that. It just mm -hmm. has to sit down. Right. And, but in Undertow, you know, one of the settings is also when, so Loya is almost set in the present day, but, you know, when we are, when, when her mother, Rukmini is younger, um, there is a lot of political kind of politically led movement and upheaval in Assam as well. And uh, how, how important was it for you to kind of have the political background to the novel? And, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm going to let you answer that first before I move on to the next part of it. Um, actually, I mean, I've said this before, there was no choice. So <laughs> this, any, any book of fiction and nonfiction you're going to set in Assam or the Northeast between the mid-70s to um, even now, you cannot avoid the political landscape. It's just there, you know? So um, 
so you don't have to struggle. You don't have to decide whether you want it there or not. It has to be there. Even if it's a small short story, even if someone goes out to buy, um, let's say, a loaf of bread, he may encounter a bomb blast. You know, so mm -hmm. the yeah. politics is always there. Um, yeah. In yeah. fact, uh, I didn't have to think of that. And um, the odd synergy was that what was happening on the outside, the insider outsider struggle on the political landscape, fed into and uh, was like uh, anchored the story of the insider outsider in in the Goswami family. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, yeah. It, it just worked very organically into this family, you know, in, into the family saga. So I didn't have to struggle. I didn't have to decide whether I wanted it or not. I had to have it. I, I could not change the, the facts on the ground there. And it worked beautifully mm -hmm. as it, it wove into the story. Yeah, and I feel yeah. like the reader kind of gets to learn about it as well because people are just generally not very aware of whatever is happening in the Northeast in general and Assam in specific. And um, through Loya, you're able to kind of understand all of these things and learn about all of these things. And I think Undertow also serves to kind of make you a lot more aware. And I think readers have also appreciated it a lot more too. Um, but also speaking of Loya, I think, you know, one of the things that I really liked about Undertow and I it kind of harkens back to how you write relationships so well as well, is apart from her relationship with, with Thorun, her grandfather, there are so many um, peripheral characters, everyone from, you know, the help in the house to the gardeners to Arun. Um, how do these characters kind of come alive in your mind? And it's really, I mean, personally speaking, it was really heartwarming for me to kind of see her building these very individual relationships with these people and have them be so genuine and so absolutely helpful to her in her as a young person. How do you how do you how do you bring these characters to life and how do you decide on them having on them being present in the book? Uh, I must confess, I, I love minor characters in a book. If I'm reading somebody else's book or short story or novel, uh, I love the minor characters because, uh, I mean, uh, um, they, they make up the map of life, you know, you, you have this, you have, uh, you, no one is living in a vacuum, no one lives in a vacuum, yes. right? Yes. So, and, um, and, you know, you, in our daily lives, you, if you look back, you really sort of examine, you'll find so many uh, characters who have uh, fed into your life and who means something to you. I've not seen them for 20 years, but who means something to you. And that memory yeah. remains, that little part of them remains within you. And I think this again goes back to life experience. We lived in this very rambling, like I told you, family. Where mm -hmm. in, uh, not only were the family members in those days, of course, you had a lot of domestic help. And um, domestic help in my family and in our part of the world also, which is to a large extent um, quite classless. Um, uh, um, in some parts are absolutely classless and even in our communities it is largely classless so you don't differentiate and people who come stay, help uh, help in your house become family their families yeah. become family yeah. and, and, it, and, and it, it rolls on you know so um, yeah. I've seen yeah. that and I think that's a beautiful way to be you know and um, you know I have these memories of um, a particular postman uh, memories of a particular uh, you know, a compounder in, 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 in a dispensary you know so um, I think that life experience shows through and um, and the strange thing is structurally in crafting, um, you you see you see uh, you see the tip of the iceberg, but I actually know everything about Roman. You know, Roman to me is as fully fleshed out as perhaps Torun is. I know what's happening in his village. Um, I know what's happening in Sita's Basti. You know, so uh, it's uh, I know them really well, although I don't bring it out to the reader. But if you were to ask me about uh, their lives, there's a whole lot more that I know about them than also on the page. But uh, somewhere the thing like um, somewhere I think it does resonate with the reader, as you've said. I think it makes the text more alive and uh, Absolutely. Yes, it makes it sort of more credible and you feel there's something real happening out here. You know? Exactly. Yeah. And, this, and you're not just stuck in the universe of these two people who are supposed yes. to be the central characters. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually really um, intrigued by that. I mean, I personally love peripheral minor characters as well because they absolutely lend themselves to forming the personality of your protagonists too. Totally. totally. And uh, yeah. And yeah. Um, no, but also um, one of the questions that I always ask all of my authors because it really like I'm really fascinated by it is that what is what are some of the other kind of literature you were consuming? And of course, Undertow took almost eight years to write. Um, but when you were in the throes of it, when you were writing kind of the, the, the chunkiest parts of it, what were some of the other literature that, that you were consuming that may or may not have influenced parts of Undertow? So normally, normally, like when I was writing Rebirth or I write uh, my short fiction, I try not to read too much. You know, there's, there's okay. also danger. There's a danger of sometimes parroting. 
and mm -hmm. uh, there's a danger there's, there's the other danger of sometimes being thrown off track by something which is very dissimilar to your writing mm -hmm. uh, or parroting something very similar to your writing so it, that that's okay if it's six to nine months or if it's a, a month for a short story but of yeah. course under yeah. it took so long i could not not read <laughs> in those eight <laughs> yeah um, and um, i always tend to read what what i enjoy reading i like I love relationships, so you'll find mm -hmm. me reading an Ann Tyler, I'll be reading Alice Munro, uh, mm -hmm. I'll be reading a Jhumpa Lahiri, like you said. I will, of course, read whatever um, the major works that come out in a year. I will be reading, uh, you know, the three, four big books that come out in a year. And I will always be reading short fiction. So for me, uh, it's like a palate cleanser, you know. Um, right. you're, yeah. you're, not yeah. or you're, um, you know, you're not in the mood, you just, um, let's say, pick up um, anything. You pick up um, uh, Eudora Welty, you pick up William Faulkner, you know. And yeah. uh, you pick up an Alice Munro, you pick up a story, you remember, go back to it, you know. So mm -hmm. I, I use short fiction to kind of uh, spur me on. So I always right. read short fiction. Okay. If nothing else, just go to the New Yorker and see what's happening on the, you know, fiction page. and. You know mm -hmm. <laughs> what's what's presented so yeah. that's the kind of reading yeah. i do and some amount of um i haven't for a long time but i would read a lot of sort of historical non-fiction you know um which which really? i enjoy black khan and you know stuff like that so right. uh, that's sort of reading so uh, but but uh, but people ask me what have i read in the lockdown so little i don't know if it's lockdown i this sort of this whole phase not it just lockdown, no, yeah. Yeah. yeah i think there's such large things happening out there that i've um, Really not been able to take, I think, fiction seriously, unfortunately. You know, it's yeah. a, I read a short story, go back to, but like, okay, but there's so much happening out there. Let's see what's happening out there. You know, I know. Yeah, but do you have a, but you have a preferred form. Do you prefer the short story over the over a full length novel or? Yes, I, I, I have to. Yes, I have to confess, I do. I do. Oh, you <laughs> are. Oh, I'm wow! I'm I would not have. have no, no, I'm an absolute no. short fiction junkie. So any, anything short, yes. Yeah. Which is why I think uh, someone, in fact, said that under to read. Someone read it in one. I, actually, a lot of people read it in one shot. You know, in in yeah. one in one, yeah. one one sitting. And somebody then uh, rang me and said, um, "It's like an extended long long short story." I said, "Wow, I, I didn't look at it that way, but yes, possibly it could look like that." <laughs> yeah, it can potentially. Yeah, due to its length, but also because of because of the ease of reading it, and you kind of. Yeah, like uh, one of the things that always have stood out for me when I'm reading reader reviews is that it just it sucks you in, and that's what you kind of want from. Um, from a book as well especially during this time like it it was released in february and we went into lockdown in march and i feel like it, it must have helped so helped so many people kind of get back to it and like we were, like you were saying and i agree completely with you that it's been so much harder to kind of read fiction because you're constantly distracted by real life but i feel like this is one of those rare kind of books where you know you're first of all you're automatically sucked in but it's also not long enough that you kind of have to like wade through yes. it yes. so yes. i am yeah and i'm and i'm really glad that more and more, more and more people are picking it up but uh but yeah um no i also wanted to ask you uh for selfish reasons as well if you're working on something else now and uh what it is i mean i'm in the thinking stage so for me it's, it's always sort of thinking thinking wool gathering mulling you know until um, something comes through Right. Yes, 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 I have. I, I, I actually didn't for a long time. I think in the last couple of months, I am sort of putting my mind to it. Right. And uh, when do you think we might be able to see something? Oh, I think a long time. I think this time it'll be not as long as Undertow, no. It's not going to be eight years. But I don't, right. I don't think it'll be as quick as a rebirth, which just took nine months to write, you know. So it'll be, it'll be um, somewhere in between, perhaps. An, an average length, perhaps a year, a couple of years, yes. Okay, that's really, <laughs> yeah, that is really um, hopeful to hear yeah um and uh, okay so um himanshi do we have any questions from the public that we want to ask janvi or uh, ma'am no we don't have any questions for now okay all right um janvi yes so do we continue um, do you want to discuss something else if you have time or yeah, do we, how much do we have time left, Himanshi? Mom, five minutes. Okay. Okay, so um, I just wanted to kind of, you know, I'm just going to kind of wrap everything up by, um, you know, I mean, Undertow is one of those rare novels which deals with very human, you know, things. It's like, you don't have to worry about kind of what is happening in the outside world it's like it's between two it's between two individuals and um i kind of really really appreciated the way you've brought these kind of individuals alive as well 
And I really want to thank you for it because it's one of the most beautifully written novels that I've read all year. I read it personally, of course, last year. So, um, and um, yeah, if anyone wants to kind of, have, who hasn't read the book just as yet, they can pick up a copy that's available in all local bookstores, but it's available online on all um, on Amazon, Flipkart, etc. too. And uh, Janvi, uh, do you want to say a few words to end this and wrap the session up? Um, just a, a big, big thank you to you, Anushri, for a short notice coming on to moderate this. And in fact, it's the first time it's the first time we're actually talking about it. I mean, the very I first know. one we tried to talk about in in March, I think, collapsed you know, because of tech problems. Yes, and, and it's a pleasure. And uh, also, thank you to the festival to for giving us this time. And just to take off on what you said about um, book deals with um, matters in between individuals, but. In a sense, um, although it deals with matters between people within a family, um, mm. it sort of um, dovetails into a lot of things happening outside, you know. So uh, someone says, oh, we've learned about the Northeast from this, we learned about Assam politics. But um, at the same time, uh, I don't, I've always felt a, a work of fiction is not really a text to go tell you all that, you know. Uh, it just kind of opens a window, to, okay, there was turbulence in the Northeast, and you please go read a little bit more about it from somewhere else. It's like, you know, a foothold there. Um, mm. At the end of it, I think, um, I think all fiction is really just universal human stories, you know, and um, I think yeah. all yeah. my work, I attempt to do that, although um, they're set in a particular place because I live in Bangalore, I'm from Assam, but, you know, eventually stories which should be able to, uh, which should resonate anywhere from Iceland to Greenland, you know, Australia, so that that is the intent of my fiction, in that you write things which anybody, with, um, which, you know, a person will resonate with, so that, that's what my fiction is about, yes. All right. Um, thank you so much, Anvi. Thank you for your... Uh, Thank you for your beautiful words, of course, and, and for those last really intriguing, thought-provoking thoughts. And uh, thank you, Himanshi. Thank you, uh, Oran City Literature Festival, and thank you, everyone who is watching. And please go read Under Two if you haven't already. Please also check out John's other books, Next Door, which is a collection of short stories, and Rebirth, which is a novel. And uh, thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Manji. Thank, Thank you, you. ma'am. On behalf of Orange Study Literature Festival, I express my sincere gratitude towards your acceptance for the session and knowledge shared with us. I would also like to thank our publisher, Support Penguin Classes, for, for cooperation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Twenty years of existence. Two universities. 23 educational institutes offering 137 courses. Rysoni Group of Institutions, a vision beyond.